Hey there, everybody. Uh, welcome back. We are just about to start a new unit on um, electrostatics. And so electrostatics is a little bit of a, uh, a different kind of tack. So far, we've been talking a lot about macroscopic things, forces on blocks and cars and planets spinning around, suns and that sort of thing. And so for the next couple of units, we're going to kind of uh, dive deeper and smaller. And with electrostatics, we're going to talk a lot about charges. And so you might have already studied a little bit of current electricity and you might know that current electricity is a flow of charges often it's a flow of electrons maybe around a circuit um, and in this case we're going to look at electrostatics which means charges that are built up in one place so something that might build up and then discharge so for example you may have like rubbed your feet on the carpet and you build up a bit of a charge then when you touch a metal doorknob you notice that there's a discharge well before that discharge happened there was a bunch of static charge built up and these charges these static charges um, are going to have forces they're going to be surrounded by fields and we're going to dive into that in this unit so the first thing to kind of recognize is a whole bunch of things about charges that you need to be um, aware of and so the first which you're probably aware of is that matter is made of particles which are positively or negatively charged. So atoms are made of protons and neutrons and electrons. The protons and the electrons have charges, plus or minus. The unit of charge is called the Coulomb, which we abbreviate as capital C. Now, charges are conserved. They are a conserved quantity, which means they cannot be created or destroyed. So we believe that whatever amount of charge the universe was created with, it's fixed. And overall, it's probably neutral. Um, charges are also discrete. And this is something that we're not gonna dive into too much today, but just this idea that charges um, uh, have a, have a they occur in finite packages. So you can have a really, really tiny amount of charge. You might have a you might have an object that has a charge built up on it. You can you can divide those charges into smaller and smaller chunks, and eventually you get to a point where you can't split it up anymore. And that smallest little chunk of, of charge, we would call that the elementary charge. And that charge is the same as the charge on one proton or one electron. Protons and electrons, of course, have the same amount of charge. One is positive and one is negative, but the, the amount of charge is the same. And so the elementary charge is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So for a proton, it would be plus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and for an electron, it would be minus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. So in order to calculate the force between two charges, you are probably likely aware that opposite charges are going to attract each other, positives attract negatives and vice versa, and the same charges are going to repel. So two positive charges are gonna push apart and so would two negative charges. So to calculate the, this amount of force, uh, we can use Coulomb's law, which says the electrostatic force between two charges is equal to K times Q1 times Q2 all divided by R squared where in this case q1 is just the amount of uh, charge on the first charge so how many coulombs that first charge has and q2 is the second charge how many coulombs is the second charge r is our separation or if you just want to think of it as the distance between the two charges how far apart they are and then k is a constant that we call coulombs constant and it has a value which can be different depending on the material they're in but for our purposes we're going to treat it as an absolute constant which has a value of 9 times 10 to the 9 newton meters squared per coulomb squared now hopefully when you see this formula and you start to kind of uh, think about it you'll notice a few similarities right off the bat so this should remind you right away of gravitation now you remember our good friend gravitation, Fg is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. And so the amount of gravitational force was really just dependent on some constant times the mass of the first object and the mass of the second object and then divided by the square of their separation. And so Coulomb's law works really similarly to that. Um, but the second thing to notice there is that electrostatic forces are much, huh, much, much stronger 
than gravitational ones. Now, how can I tell that? Well, one way to, to do that is to just consider, for example, look at these constants that we're involved with. This g value, remember, is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. And so Coulomb's constant is 9 times 10 to the positive 9. That's like over 100 billion billion times bigger. So what that really means is that while it takes a large planet with a lot of mass to keep us stuck to it, relatively small charges can create an equal amount of force. Um, so when we talk about charges, we're not going to talk about them on the scale of coulombs. They might be on the scale of millicoulombs or even microcoulombs. Really small amounts of charge are going to generate large amounts of force. So um, a quick difference between gravitational and electrostatic force is that obviously gravity always attracts things. So gravity is always an attracting force. And, um, electrostatic forces can attract or repel depending on the situation. So like we saw, if we have two light charges, that's gonna create a repulsion. Two opposite charges, that's gonna be an attraction. Now, I'm just gonna throw this in here, and this might not make a ton of sense until we do some of the practice, but when solving for electrostatic forces, we will not use the signs of the charges. So what do I mean by that? Well, whether you have a positive or a negative charge, when you go ahead up here and you plug that into these values here for K1 and K, uh, sorry, Q1 and Q2, it doesn't really matter if they're positive or negative. Um, we're just going to use that. And so really this is going to give us the amount of the force or the magnitude of the force. And so instead, we're going to determine the direction of the force based on vector addition. So forces are vectors. We're going to treat them as vectors. Um, the sign of the charge isn't really going to tell us the direction. We're going to figure that out on our own. So just as an example here, a couple of quick um, calculations. And again, um, you should hit pause in the video and go ahead and try these yourselves and then, and then hit unpause and see how you did. And assuming, of course, that you have done that, I will now solve them. So if we have two students sitting one meter apart, the force of gravity between them, Fg is going to equal g m1 m2 over r squared. So this is going to be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 85 times another 85 divided by 1 squared. And this is going to be a very small amount. This is like 4.8 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. So the gravitational attraction between the two students, very, very small. However, if, we, if they each had a charge of two millicoulombs, and a millicoulomb doesn't sound like a lot, but we're going to see that that would be a pretty substantial charge, the electrostatic force between them would be K times Q1 times Q2 over R squared, which would be 9 times 10 to the 9. Multiply that by 2 times 10 to the negative 3, and then 2 times 10 to the negative 3 again all divided by, again, one meter apart squared. And this come, answer comes out to be 36,000 Newtons. So what sounded like two very small charges of two milli coulombs would create enough force to kind of throw them across the room, which probably wouldn't be too good. So we can see that we're going to, um, when dealing with charges, it doesn't take a lot to create a substantial amount of force. Um, let's take a look at another example here. So we've got uh, two point charges produce 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6, uh, sorry, two point charges of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs and 2.4 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs produce a force of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 3 newtons on each other. How far apart are these two charges? So they're both positive charges and so they're going to uh, produce a repulsion. Okay, so I know that they're pushing each other apart, and I can see how much force that's generating. Um, the question here is, what is their separation? So what is their R value? How far apart are they? Well, looking at my formula for uh, Coulomb's law, I see that Fe equals KQ1, Q2 over R squared. And so solving for R, that's going to be equal to the square root of KQ1, Q2, um, all over Fe. And so when I plug my values in here, 9 times 10 to the 9 times 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 
times 2.4 times 10 to the negative 6. And I'm running out of space, but I'll make it divided by 2.2 .2 times 10 to the negative 3. And when I put that all on my calculator, I end up with 4.2 meters of separation. Okay. Now, one last example here. What do we do when we've got multiple charges that are all interacting? So I've got uh, three charges here all in a line, all in a row. And so just to kind of keep them organized, I'm just going to call them A, B, and C. So the first charge here, 1.6 microcoulombs, 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, is placed near a 2.5 times 10 to the negative 6 microcoulomb charge and a negative 2 times 10 to the negative 6 microcoulomb charge. And it tells me the distances between these things. So this first distance here, this R value is 2.0 times 10 to the negative 2. And then this R value is uh, 3.5 times 10 to the negative 2 uh, meters. And so what it's asking is, what is the net electric force on that first charge, on charge A? Well, this is a little bit confusing at first, but remember that with um, we can find individual forces, and then if we need to add them up, we can use vector addition. So the first thing I would do is say, listen, let's just ignore charge C. Just put your hand right over charge C and just ignore it for a second. Charge A and B are going to have an interaction. What kind of interaction are they going to have? Well, they're both positive charges. I didn't say it explicitly, but the fact that there's no sign there means that those are both positive charges. And positive charges are going to repel. So there would be a force here that pushes this uh, charge this way. I'm going to call that FAB. And there would be another force over here, equal and opposite, also called FAB. It would be pushing backwards on charge B. And so if I want to know what's going to happen between A and C, I'm just going to put my hand right over top of charge B. I'm going to cover it up and ask myself, well, what's happening between charges A and C? Well, A is positive and C is negative. So that's going to be an attraction. So there'll be another charge here, pardon me, another force this way, which I would call AC. And over here on charge A, there will be a force this way, which I could call force A. C because they're going to be attracted. Now the question doesn't really ask us for this but just because I started drawing forces I have to complete the picture or I won't feel good about myself. I'm going to put my hand over charge A and think about what's happening between B and C. Well B and C are opposite charges so they're going to be attracting each other. So there will be another force in this system here. I call this FBC pulling this way and there will be an equal and opposite force FBC pulling that way. So you can see that depending on which charge they ask you about the net force on, um, the way that those forces act, you can't just simplify it and think about is it an attraction or repulsion. You have to look at the actual picture. So for example, just take a look at charge B. Charge B uh, has a, a repulsion which is pushing it to the right, but also an attraction which is pushing it to the right. Well, both of those forces are to the right. So for one with the net force on B, I'm just going to add them up. For charge A, which is what we're really interested in though, you can see that those are working in opposite directions. So I've got one force to the left and one force to the right. So since those are in opposite directions, I'm going to have to subtract them. So to find the amount of force of each of these, so to find FAB, I'm just going to use Coulomb's law, K, Q, A, Q, B, all divided by R squared. And I'm going to use my charge A and charge B. So that's going to be 9 times 10 to the 9. And I'm going to multiply that times 1.7 times 10 to the negative 6 times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 6 and divide that by 2.0 times 10 to the negative 2. And that whole thing is squared. And when I crunch the numbers on all of that, it comes out to be about 95.6 newtons. Okay, and that's over to the left. For the um, second force there, force AC, that would be the K value times QA times QC uh, all divided by their separation. So that would be 9 times 10 to the 9 uh, and then times 1.7 times 10 to the negative 6 and then times 2.0 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 3.5 times 10 to the negative 2. There's so a lot of scientific notation going on here. Now, this might be the point where you're like, wait a second, Mr. Trask, why no negative sign right there? No negative. And the reason I'm not going to bother with the negative sign there is 
it's not really going to help me figure out the direction. I know the direction of that force because when I look back at my picture, I know that that force is to the right. And I figured that out before I did any of my calculations. So when I run these numbers here, this is really just telling me the amount of force, not the direction. So I'm not going to use negative signs in my force calculations. And when I crunch these numbers, these end up at right around 25.0 newtons. So I can see that my net force on A F net, I'm just going to use winners minus losers. So this is like FAB minus FAC. And so that's just 95.6 minus 25.0 is 70.6 Newtons. Now it might be helpful to specify that that is to the left because that's the way it goes. And that's it. Okay, so that's it for our first video on electrostatics.